Hi everyone and welcome to another Out and About video. Now today this beautiful weather has brought me and Vicky over to Derbyshire. We're staying the night here. We visited one location to do one video and now we're here in a little village called Eam. Now Eam is also known as the Plague Village. And this village played an important role in trying to cull and stem the plague back in 1665 and 1666 but it has a tragic story behind it. We're going to get into that story today, my friends. We're going to have a walk around the village. We're going to look at some of the attractions and some of the reminders of that dark, turbulent past. We're going to visit the museum and see what that has to offer. We're also going to visit some sites, some monumental sites. I won't say which played an important role, but which are certain remembers, like I said, of that dark time, that dark period back in our past. This, my friends, is the story of the Plague Village. So we've come out, myself and Vicky, to Derbyshire, as we said at the intro. And we visited Bakewell to start with. That was our first destination. We've covered a tragic story there. And we have since, now obviously, we've made our way over to Eam here in Derbyshire. We're going to tell the tale of how this little village became synonymous with the plague back in 1665 and into 1666. We're going to mention one or two notable residents that once lived here and who they made the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of others. And we're going to tell the tale of how what we went through in 2019, not just myself and Vicky obviously, but all of the UK and all of the world, when the pandemic struck and how it relates so much to what happened back here, like I said, all those years ago, back in 1665 and 1666. The similarities are uncanny, to say the least. But the one difference that we could argue and say is that the townspeople and the village people of Eam, they sacrificed themselves for the greater good. Whereas, obviously, in today's society, we were told we had to sacrifice ourselves for the greater good of humanity. You'll understand why as and when we get into the story. So one of the first monuments and monumental sites that we're going to visit here over in Eam is what's known as the Riley Graves. And it's here where there I think is seven family members, one father and six children. And their graves are just in this field here, which we're going to go to now and it is the graves of the Hancock family. So these are the Riley Graves and the final resting places of the Hancock family. And then let's look at the headstones first before we come to this one. So you've got John, I think it's Hancock. Again, very difficult to read. Um, I, can't really, I, just, I can just see 1666. Can't really make the age out, but that says John Hancock. Elizabeth Hancock. And again, as you can see, it's badly weathered. And 
then you've got I'm not sure what that says there's another Hancock August 7th 1666 not quite sure what it says Then you have William Hancock, August 7th, 1666. You've got Anne Hancock. Not sure what August, is it August the 6th, August the 7th, 1666. And the next, Alice Hancock. August the 9th, 1666. I think these were the children. I think these six were the children. But in the middle, you've got the father. I can't. Here lieth, I think it says, or buried, the body of John Hancock, senior who died August 7th, 1666. So I think this is the father. Can't really make much of that out. Very, very difficult to make what that says out. But I think that is the father's tomb. And like I said, I think these are all his children. And it was the wife who had to bury all of her family here in what's known as Riley's Fields. And from all accounts, the Hancock family used to live in the farm just over there. And that is Riley's farm. And that is where they were based, and that is where they used to, to live. But it's such sad, such sadness to see basically this plot and an actual plague grave I think this is the first plague grave or graves official ones that me and Vicky have actually seen up close and in person but to see so many interments from one family it is sad just what the plague did back in 1665 and 1666 From all accounts, it was a descendant of the Hancock family that came across these headstones lying in this field when he was researching, obviously, his family history. And he or she, I should say, came to this location and stood the headstones back up and made this into what it is today. And it's a dark reminder of exactly what happened, like I said, back in those turbulent times, back in the 1600s, 1665 to 1666. And it puts into comparison with what happened here in the UK and all around the world. What, 2019, I think it was, when, well, the pandemic, I won't say the C word, but when the pandemic hit, as it did, and we're all put into a lockdown and, you know, networks of infrastructures were shut down, weren't they? And we all struggled, we all suffered. But imagine that back 1600s what 370 years old roughly imagine the same scenario being put on lockdown on shutdown but when conditions were a lot harder and a lot worse than what they are today and yet one poor woman one survivor of an entire family had to bury her own children and that of her husband here in riley's field so the tale takes place here in Eam back in August 1665 
when a tailor by the name of George Vickers had received some cloth that had been sent and dispatched up from London. Now the cloth itself, when it arrived, by all accounts it had been left dormant for several days before it was inspected. But that cloth, when inspected, it was found to be damp. Now, not thinking much of this, George Vickers himself, I think he hung it up over a fireplace or somewhere warm so it could dry out. But what he unwittingly did was unleash the plague bacteria. Now, the fleas that obviously transported the bubonic plague had been lying dormant, if you will, on this cloth. And obviously when it started to dry out, the fleas themselves, I don't know if, if the eggs they, they'd hatched or the fleas themselves jumped off, but more certainly, that piece of cloth was the, it was the beginning of the end, if you will, for the, the residents and the villagers of Eam. Now, obviously, George Vickers at the time was unaware as to all this, but it was only a matter of days from the minute he opened that parcel for it to dry out before he actually contacted the deadly virus and died himself from the effects of it. With George Vickers being the first victim here, over in Eam to die of the, the plague and I think it was the 7th of September 1665 so it was only a matter of weeks after receiving the the, um, the fabric itself and the opening up before obviously he passed away. Now the plague itself took hold and it began to decimate the village. Now a decision had to be made on how to try to cull this deadly disease and a decision was made that the village and the villagers and all those within inside the village would self-quarantine and they would ask everybody they would all club together if you will and not leave and not allow anybody into this small village now obviously this came at a cost and those that did stay, because from all accounts there would have been one or two people that would leave before the self-isolation began, but those that did stay, in the belief that they were doing the better good, if you will, for, for mankind and for neighbouring villages and towns, you could argue and, and, and say that, obviously, by staying behind and self-isolating, they were signing their own death warrants. The bubonic plague in 1665, as many know, claimed the lives of many, and Eam was no different. Now we're going to make our way to another important monument, if you will, here in Eam, and that is to a boundary stone. Now the boundary stone in question was used as a wayward post, if you will, as well, and it was more a case of people from outside towns, villages, they would come and leave, I won't say offerings isn't the right word, but they would leave, I think, clothing, food, essentials basically, so the villagers of Eam could get through the self-isolation. Now in return, the villagers themselves would leave payment by leaving coins in some tiny little holes in the stone itself. And this stone, from all accounts, well, it used to be filled with vinegar. Now, I'm not saying it's the same type of vinegar that we know of today, but back in the 1600s, it was believed that by placing the coins in the vinegar, it acts as a disinfectant, if you will, and it killed the plague bacteria, the plague virus. Now, how true that is, what the science behind that is, I don't entirely know. I'm not sure if that was the case. But certainly, the boundary stone itself, like I said, it was used as a, as a wayward or a mile marker or whatever you want to call it. And like I said, people would leave essentials for, for the people, or for the people, I should say, the villagers of Eam, to try, like I said, to get through this horrible, horrible moment and period in their, in their time. Thank you. 
as we get closer to it, we keep coming across things such as this. And I said to Vicky, I said, how many people have touched this? Back in 1665 or 1666, who perhaps had the plague virus in the DNA, on the hands, and they touched it, possibly leaving the infection behind them. It's crazy to think that. But uh, all these monuments and all these stone markers are still here to this day. What was once probably a busy thoroughway is now nothing more than a tiny little uneven pathway. And again, like I said, when we're touching that, that stone further back, how many people have walked this path or walked this path back when the plague was rife in the 1600s? I mean, coming this way, you are literally walking in history. And I doubt much has changed since then. I mean, the pathway itself looks original. It doesn't look like it's been developed any further. Um, okay, you may have these walls here at the side, I guess, but the path itself, it is literally like walking in the footsteps of all those people 300, 350 years ago. And like I said, it's hard to imagine what, uh, what they went through. Now, I think the plague stone or the boundary stone, not the plague stone. I suppose it could be called a plague stone. The boundary stone from what I'm seeing, I think is just further ahead, just on this hill line. And like I said, this will play an important role in keeping the villages of Eam going as long as they possibly could. This is the boundary stone. And as you can see, as we're saying further back, you've got several holes bored into the stone and it's believed these were filled with vinegar and someone has left some coins inside it now and coins would be placed in here inside the vinegar for those that were leaving food clothing and other essentials by the residents further down below and i think it's called stony middleton and that is the village and the area which the people of Eam were trying to protect by self-isolating. But this is the boundary stone. Now it is crazy to think that 370 years, my maths isn't brilliant, but around 370 years, people were coming here, like I said, to place coins and to place food and other essentials to help the villagers of Eam. And the Eam villagers themselves were committing the ultimate sacrifice by self-isolating. They weren't forced to do it. They weren't made to do it by any government or any politician. It was all a collective effort. And they did it solely to protect the residents of Stony Middleton. Obviously not just Stony Middleton, but obviously the general public at large. Now this plague, as we all know with the pandemic we've been through, was highly contagious. And if it, one person got it, hundreds got it. And then thousands, then millions. We've all been through it recently with the pandemic. The plague back in 1600s, don't forget, they never had the technology we had. They don't have social media, they don't have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they didn't have newspapers, they didn't have televisions and news articles like what we have today. So the plague had time to evolve, it had time to spread like wildfire. But if it wasn't for George Vickers getting hold of that fabric which was sent from London, perhaps the villagers of Eam themselves would have missed the plague. They, it, it just may have bypassed them. Obviously we'll never know that, but that's all it took. It just took that one delivery of fabric that brought this infestation of fleas into Eam and ultimately cost the lives of several hundred villagers. Now the self-isolation came together and I think it was organized by 
the Reverend William Mompesson. And he was the guy that kind of, he would, one could argue and say he instigated the, the old movement, the old self-isolation. Like I said, nobody was, from what I gather, forced into it. But before the self-isolation began, there is talk and there is scriptures and stories of people actually leaving the village and escaping to other counties, if you will. Now, whether or not they took the virus with them, that's just, we're gonna obviously guess at that. Nobody ever knows, or will ever know. But uh, Mon Pesson himself, he stayed behind. Now, sadly, his wife, I think she was called Catherine, she contacted the plague, and I think it was August when she passed away. I think it was August 1666, and her grave is in the churchyard, our churchyard in the centre of Eam village. Now we're going to go to the village itself. Now I'm going to uh, visit the churchyard. And we're also going to go past what's known as the plague cottages. Now the plague cottages have, from what I remember, they've got plaques outside detailing those lives that was lost during the plague. Um, some of them have nine lives. I think that they've lost some have got seven victims, but the plaques are outside So we're going to walk past there and we'll stop by and we'll take some footage for you guys We're going to stop by the church. We're going to visit Catherine's grave We're going to pop inside the church because from what I gather I think there's some kind of scripture or some kind of role which shows I don't know if it's the victims of the plague but it most certainly shows those villagers that lived here back in 1665 and 1666. So that might be interesting to uh, to go and look at. Now we do hope you're enjoying this video and if you do, don't forget to give us a, a big thumbs up and don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel. Um, we've got plenty more stories. This one in particular today has always intrigued me. Um, the plague village, if you will, and the story of how the villagers all clubbed together and self-isolated and paid the ultimate sacrifice with their own lives. Because like I said, many, many people lost lives here, around 250 out of a possible 750 lost lives. So like I said, if you do enjoy this video and other videos similarly, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up and don't forget to share the video. Don't forget to subscribe, as I just said, because like I said, there's loads of videos coming in. If you subscribe, obviously you won't miss out. Now we're gonna to go to uh, the centre now of the village and we'll visit the churchyard and the plague cottages. Right, now Vicky's had to put me right. She overheard me say Catherine contacted the virus around about August 1666. Now obviously she didn't contact the virus. She contracted the virus, as I have now just been informed. So if you hear me say contacted in that segment, I'm sorry, I do apologise, but Vicky spotted it and put me right. Contracted. She contracted the plague and sadly died. Now... I'm not sure if these are legitimately placed because look how narrow this pathway is. We've come this way to go to the boundary stone, but again, I mentioned it coming this way. How many people have touched these walls? Now, interestingly, I've just noticed this. Boreholes again placed into the stones. Were these filled with vinegar and then coins placed inside? And when the villagers came through, they stopped here, took all the possessions and those that were coming this way, took the coins out before going back that way. But that's definitely, definitely interesting. I didn't see that coming this way. Vic, what do you reckon to that? Yeah, that is They're funny. similar, aren't they, to what's? Well, they wouldn't have come this far, would they? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, don't forget the plague stones just on that hill line. But that's supposed to be there. And that's supposed to be the marker, yeah. the boundary. Mm -hmm. But they're definitely, they're definitely, definitely similar boreholes to what's further back. But like you said, this is getting closer and closer to the village itself. I mean, it's narrow, but it, that would make sense. Did they stop here at this pathway? People put the coins in, vinegar, all the goods were left maybe on the floor. Food, clothing and other essentials. Right, let's make our way towards the village and towards the church. Now me and Vicky's just been talking about the gate post there with those little holes bored into it. What was to stop people leaving the village of Eam back in 1665 and 1666? I mean, I know the villagers all agreed to self-isolate. They weren't forced to by any, like I said, by any government or by any police and from what I gather. So what was to stop somebody 
maybe saying, well, I'll go and collect the essentials, I'll go and collect the food, and I'll put the payments in the coins, in the vinegar, in the, in the boreholes. What was to stop them carrying on going towards Stony Middleton and leaving certain death here in Eam? Now, unless those gate posts and those boundary markers, whether or not they were being manned by people at the time to stop villagers coming and going as they will or as they please, I don't know. Does any, if anybody else is watching this video who knows more about the history of, of things like this, such as Eam and the plague, and how they would have stopped that happening, comment down below, because I'm intrigued with that one. What was to stop people leaving this, this tiny little village and obviously possible death? What was to stop them going to Stony Middleton and other nearby villages? Comment down below. By November the 1st, 1666, and almost 14 months after George Vickers has lost his life and become the first victim of the plague here in Eam, over 250, 260 residents had sadly died. Now, considering that Eam itself had around 750 residents, the death toll by ratio was much higher here than it was in the entirety of London. Now, put that into comparison, how big London is compared to this little village here and the death toll was higher by ratio per person than in a city such as the size of London. So this is Eam Church and this is where the wife of William Mompesson is interred and she's just on our left so we'll walk her around the path and we'll go and pay our respects and like Vicky put me right earlier she didn't contact the disease, she contracted the disease. And it was on August the 25th, 1666, when she would die from the plague. So Catherine Mompesson, and this is her final resting place here in Eam Church. And as you can see, she's right outside the door in the church. Now the play cottages are just to the left of Eam Church, which are just down here. So we're going to go to there now and we'll take some footage and show you guys the names of the victims and all those who sadly died just along this stretch here.
crazy, isn't it? So from all accounts, those that died in the homes were generally buried in their own property, in the back gardens, front gardens. They weren't buried in Ian Churchyard. And I think this was to stop the spread of the disease. So those that died, like I said, were buried in their own premises. So that is it from the village of Eam. If you like the video today, don't forget to give us a big thumbs up, don't forget to comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Have you guys ever visited the village? If so, let us know down below. Now, me and Vicky have made our way over to Tidswell or Tideswell, and it's here where our base is for the evening. So we're gonna go and enjoy a few luxury drinks in this nice warm weather. We want you to take care of yourselves, and we'll be back soon with another tale from our dark, but at times, glorious past. Take care, guys.